We are part of the series of art and architecture um, lecture that we are trying to, in which we are trying to combine architecture and um, architectural theory, and also with some kind of artistic um, programming. Uh, we are doing this with, uh, on, with the great help of uh, Transit SK. Let me also welcome uh, Judith Angel, who is the director um, of this institution, and let me thank her for all of these great um, opportunities that we have here in the faculty. And also let me welcome today our very um, dearest friends, um, two Mikhaels, while also, as you are, most of you are architects, and maybe try to show you what also the architects can do uh, in our real, not only maybe focusing on everyday design of houses, but maybe uh, going into more details and more um, deep research of some topics that are very actual and how can we react to them. So, thank, thank you, you very much, thank everyone. You, so, um, from the part of Trangi I would like to tell for whom don't know what, that uh, we are located here in the North Bratislava, close to the railway station and Gashvika Street, and we are dealing with contemporary art, experimental and critical art projects and other interdisciplinary projects. And the collaboration with the Faculty of Architecture is part of this uh, interdisciplinary project. And um, I am uh, glad to greet our uh, guest, uh, Mikhail Hitzman, and um, Mikhail Stinganel, who was already in uh, autumn. Uh, we had a lecture with him in uh, last autumn, and uh, now um, they are coming back with the topic of uh, um, urban uh, mobility and uh, public space, and uh, uh, they um, are interested, or their research is focusing on uh, nodes and hubs and uh, traffic corridors, which are uh, important for uh, uh, studying uh, transformations in uh, society and also political transitions and uh, individual uh, routes and uh, routines. And uh, their um, research is uh, explicitly interdisciplinary. They uh, work uh, in uh, many fields, like uh, artists and uh, curators, cultural scientists, and uh, also architecture theory. Now they both are uh, based in uh, Vienna. And uh, they also set up a platform called the Tracing Spaces in 2012. And uh, they are uh, also working together on a long-term project called the Stop and Go, uh, Note of Transformation and Migration. And um, today's uh, lecture will uh, touch uh, more or less uh, I mean maybe this topic. So I'm inviting uh, both Mikhail to uh, tell us uh, in detail about uh, uh, the research and uh, the topic they uh, developed in this topic. We both have studied architecture originally in Graz, Austria. Then we got by accident into some sort of artistic career, and I got later into a career of a historian. And currently we are working in all three fields, despite that we are not building buildings, but only exhibitions. So this is the, let's say, most physical um, work we are doing. And on the other hand side, we are doing our own installations, uh, indoor and outdoor in public space. And today I will talk about our works, and tomorrow Michael will offer a, a workshop in mapping techniques, including also a lecture on the history and of cartography mapping in the field of architecture, urban design, and political activism, which are sometimes overlapping and sometimes uh, discussed in totally different, uh, from totally different point of views. Uh, I will start with a bit boring introduction, because otherwise I will never remember what we argued when we applied for getting the project. If you're working in the free field, like we do, you have to write applications, and the applications, of course, has have, have to address somebody who considers him or herself to be an expert in this field. And so you have to give evidence that you have read all the books and they know all the details, and you also have to, which is very strange for us, you have to tell them how important you are yourself, and how important the project is that you're doing. And this is very difficult for us because we grew up in sort of Kakanian, uh, Austrian-Hungarian, bourgeois style of understatement that you just, you know, 
we don't need to mention, for example, Walter Benjamin or Sigmund Freud because we had read it anyway, anyway in school. So if it's in, in, in American style of presentation, you have to you know, tell everybody your CV, what you, what you did and whom you meet and how important you are. And in application, especially in science, it's, it, it is very difficult for us from our culture to make everything so super important. But I'll show you, I will, I will mix between two presentations, one for the art world and one for the world of science. This is our own presentation, the less uh, complicated one. But how does it disappear? And as you see, this is typically the more academic presentation. You have to have your institution. In our case, it's very funny because our institutions always change, so we are obliged theoretically to change presentation design as well. So once upon a time, I was working at Bauhaus Dessau, or frequently, and once upon a time, which was very recently, we worked at the Academy of Fine Arts because that had been the host for the research project. That means that we asked friends teaching there to sign the papers we handed in. And it was, at, interestingly, at the Institute for Art Theory and Cultural Studies, we could have applied with our architects' friends, but our architects' friends refused to sign the papers because they considered us to be co-competitors in the field. The project, as I mentioned before, was hosted by the Academy. It was funded by the Vienna Science and Technology Fund in a program that was called Public Spaces in Transition. So we had to make Vienna the main focus of research, but we also wanted to travel around, so we had to have some striking arguments to legitimize our road trips, of course, by calling for a comparative research with other nodes of mobility and migration. And we had to have partners who are experts in those fields where we, have, we lack expertise. One was Emilia Carabueva, a Sofia-based anthropologist and historian who worked on Bulgarian truck drivers during communist period of time. And the other one was Dalmo Pikna, a uh, Tallinn-based human geographer who, to our confusion, had not been a Marxist critical geographer like all our other friends, but a different postmodern geographer. <laughs> because he grew up in a post-communist uh, country, so therefore being a communist geographer is not very fashionable, like for all the famous guys we all read that all come from Britain. And so I made this small reddish uh, arguments for a lecture for architects because then comes the hard stuff. So everybody knows that cities are foundations uh, grounded for the reason of doing trade with others. It's a place where you save the goods for being stolen and it's a place where you trade, therefore you have to have trading connections and routes and streets and invite people to come and offer the goods. This is the reason for almost all urban settlements, and there is a second uh, uh, argument for the choice of the place where to found a city that is, it should be a defensible space. And as we see in the city of Bratislava, there is the hillside with the fortress, there's the Danube. The Danube is a border, but crossing the Danube is, of course, a great opportunity for increasing the prices for the goods that you uh, transport over. Vienna is the same. We have a very little hillside, it's only a little rock where the ancient city of Vienna was built. But the Danube had so many arms uh, in front of the city of Vienna that it was very easy to cross the Danube. So on one hand side, the Roman Empire chose Vienna to defend from the evil Germans. And on the other hand side, it was a good place for trading because it was easy to cross the Danube, for example. So urban settlements are network nodes of mobility since their first introduction into history. And then, of course, very often new means, means of transport create new routes or restructure the urban environment. We know the introduction of the railway, the introduction of the steamboats. Steamboats made the Danube a very valuable uh, transport corridor for a period of time, actually for a quite long period of time until the NATO bombed Serbia in 1999 when the railway bridge fell into the Danube and all traffic on train and by boat on the Danube collapsed for several years and never uh, recuperated. 
On the other hand, sites we know that uh, modern air cargo changed the world, that the trans, uh, the trans continental container terminals and container ships <coughs> changed the world, as, for example, currently displayed in an exhibition by the American artist Alan Secula in Vienna, who for us, as in our career as artists, is somehow like a godfather of 1990s, uh, let's say the return of the social into arts, or, or a guy who was more or less celebrated for reintroducing documentary photography and, and, and reloading it with a poetic value in uh, a time of postmodern post -modern transformation. <coughs> and what is interesting is, of course, that <coughs> new political uh, bypassing big city centers, of course, can make some cities or can destroy the economy of cities or of valleys in the Alps. When you build a tunnel in one valley, the other valley might die economically because all the traffic passes by on the other road. The same might happen if there is a little city like Trieste, which is a rather big city in the Mediterranean Sea, and they miss to, they, they miss to, to modernize their harbor, and the then communist Slovenian city of Kopor invests into the harbor. Then, then the city of Trieste, for example, can get into sort of superfluous situation as an economic hub forever and ever, and they will never have a chance against the Slovenians in this business. Uh, and of course, there can be several political economic changes, warfare, or very ambitious new governments that want to modernize in a specific sense, uh, political allies like European Union or that include and exclude countries. There can be a lot of reasons for transporting goods, for, tra for traveling, for commuting, or for migrating. And there is a certain resilience, resilience of infrastructure. Once an enormous amount of money and skills and technology and materials invested into something, these places will survive for a certain period of time. The beautiful harbor in Trieste is still there, also it's not used like that. Rijeka will show uh, until 2020 what they're doing with the, all the, uh, uh, let's say, industrial heritage infrastructure for the cultural capital that they will host. And we also know from Vienna, the place where we are working, we're working on North Bahnhof, not West Bahnhof, which is a former important railway station for passengers going to the north, which meant Prague, Berlin and Hamburg, but moreover for bringing goods from the harbor of Hamburg to Vienna. This, hub, this, this railway station as a passenger terminal collapsed after the end of monarchy already, but the area was still there and so used the area for a cargo hub for manipulating freight and goods uh, from all over the world. And this cargo terminal still exists until today or until the next three years in the very midst of Vienna, which is a very surprising situation that we have a, a 19th century railway station in the very center of the city with all the cargo lines and all the warehouses still existing and still used. And of course, new nodes can be created, others, others can be degraded or substituted, substituted or get superfluous. From our last experience, or my last, let's say, 25 years of experience of traveling southeast, we were, doing, we were going the Yugoslav road all our lifetime. Then when there was war in former Yugoslavia, we were going the new route, which was the Hungarian-Romanian route. And at, alongside these streets, immedi immediately, all kind of informal markets emerged and all kind of infrastructure emerged that later became stabilized and a new European highway, or part of a new European highway system. Interestingly, when we were Staying overnight at the Romanian side, they all told us never go to, to never buy, pass through Serbia because they're robbing you. While the Serbs told us never pa pa pass through Romania because the Romanians rob you. So until until now, the old myths of of the wild East or the wild Balkan is always projected to the neighbor country from all sides. Maybe the Bulgarians are the only one who, who project that on themselves. So, so they always make themselves more guilty than they are, interestingly. And now I come to the black typefaces, where it gets a bit more complicated, because these are exactly the words we, that we put into our application. So this project, that you don't know yet what it is, because that's what science is about. First comes theory, then comes what you want to do. 
if you then still know what you wanted to do from the beginning. This project draws extensively on theories from interdisciplinary mobility studies, in our case inspired by cultural anthropology, human geography and urban studies, and on mapping discourses which, although fairly well established in the English-speaking world, are still underrepresented in the German scientific community. This was only a few years before today, and nobody criticized that, so everybody seemed to agree, because we luckily had a, most of our peers had been from Britain, and they felt quite comfortable with this, you know, praising their expertise. And mobility studies is definitely a relatively new field, uh, founded by John Urey at Lancaster University, and it's practiced and, let's say, expanded by all these PhD students, who now have prof professorships all over the world. And uh, this is explicitly not migration studies. So it's called mobility studies in plural, which implies all sort of mobilities from tourism to migration, from transport uh, to uh, online communication. And Stop and Go, the Notes of Transportation and Transition was the title focuses its research on the transformation of the informal and formal hubs, nodes, and terminals at the pan-European road corridors in Eastern Europe and Vienna that emerged parallel to the increase of traffic volume after the fall of communism, and moreover, their impact on the public realm at the margins that's even in the, course of the, the core of the cities. Pan-European road corridors, pan-European corridors is a terminus technicus of European Union that is, let's say, the positive utopian dream of the European Union that if we build infrastructure, we can connect people, then people start to trade with each other and then they start to love each other. And as you can see, there are countries which take all the money from the European Union to build infrastructure, but that doesn't make them love the others automatically. And nevertheless, in, in, nevertheless the, let's say, uh, the social designers in the European Union have a very wide-ranging vision. So, one day in the future, this might have some effects, the effects intended. And on the other hand side, what is called hubs, nodes, and terminals, for example, was criticized by some peers that we have to make very detailed description of what it is. First, it's very simple, we just said a highway gas station, a border station, a toilet next to the road, uh, a service station for trucks, a uh, semi-legal market, a bus terminal, etc. All these places are places where you stop or where you are stopped, no matter whether it's for customs control or that you desperately need to go to the toilet. If you go to the toilet, you very likely hang out for a while, and if there are other opportunities or things to, be, to do there, then you would encounter with these offers. So, Many of these very little terminals or hubs or non-terminals, just parking lots, became, as you all know, large markets. We know that when the borders had been very harshly controlled, on both sides of the borders usually you had these uh, markets. And after the fall of the Iron Curtain, we had, for example, a sort of radical increase of sex industries between the low-wage countries and the rich countries. Uh, many of them also had been part of urban research and of artistic research and of course of research by uh, NGOs and social institutions. And we were arguing when increasing numbers of people are obliged to spend increasing amounts of time in transit, when their vehicles serve increasingly as a form of personal shelter or home, then transition nodes along the primary routes where traffic stops and the exchange between the actors and route happens acquire have a greater significance. So in transit for us was not transit of forced migration, but transit of people moving on these roads. We had applied in 2013, as you all know, the big wave of, of immigration happened in 2015. That was during our project. But before we didn't even want to deal with, explicitly with forced migration, because when we drove all the roads, we met so many migrants of all kinds, and nobody cared about he is forced or not. It was just that they wanted to go from A to B for a good reason. And we didn't want to judge anybody for the reason he goes, but just to investigate how they go and how they organize the trip and where they meet people which help them further. This is true for a truck driver as well as a forced migrant, that they have the network of informants, 
the notes where they know where to ask if you are in trouble, or the techniques how you have to behave for not being detected. And also these spaces in general are considered to be socially produced, no matter if they are a unit private or public property. The very same spaces can be at different times featureless non-places or lived spaces where only private concerns of a few individuals can be negotiated or even a wider public might encounter for discussions. Uh, Marc O'Shea in mobility studies is the big enemy. In urban studies, or let's say all my friends who are uh, working in critical urban studies, all love to criticize everything as a not place or desperately search for non places to make appropriate artistic appropriation. So there's a boom within our friends. They say, oh, this is a place that is vacant. It has no meaning, no history, nothing. So it's the perfect place for us to encounter and make some participatory projects with nobody because nobody's there. If somebody is there, then it's no more a non place because then this place has a meaning to these people. So there's a big uh, contradiction in the arguments about non place that are so popular within urban studies. So that, the, that we ourselves also said it's just a question of time when you go to a specific place. This place can be at these places where they meet on the street can be non places or important places. They can have no history because you don't know what the history is, or they have a very specific history, and they can become anchors in the everyday scheme of their multi-local existence, point at which they endeavor to establish certain rituals and routines as a means to recuperate or refresh the contact with a source and target reason, just to call back home, for example, and above all, to nurture their sense of fragmented communities to meet friends, or <coughs> at least colleagues, other truck drivers, for example, other migrants, other traders. Uh, and of course, they meet many people of very different, of the travel for very different reasons, with very different interests. And therefore, they automatically are urban nodes in the sense of early favorite, and they are rather dynamic forms of, they represent rather dynamic forms of urbanity. In my field, in our field of, let's say, Western Marxist informed. Uh, urbanists, early favorite is of course the godfather. You just have to mention without, in our circles that you draw intensively on early favorite and everybody will say, <laughs> you're the good guy. Interestingly, almost nobody had read the books entirely because this is almost impossible. And despite of three persons who made the PhD about this, nobody can repeat what is written in the books. So this is a really very brilliant theorist, theoretician to use because nobody can criticize me for misinterpreting him because nobody really knows on which page this might have been what I'm quoting. And those who make PhDs about him always talk, tell us, you will never ever understand Lefebvre because he's French and you're German, Austrian with this very absurd belief in the words. So he's playing with words and arguments, and we want to believe in them. Okay, we are educated Jewish Catholic, so we are a bit more playful than the Germans. Yes, but it doesn't help you. So only, speak, only people who really are into French language can understand his joy to play with us, uh, let's say, West, Western European Marxist uh, beginners. So the, and then there comes in something that is special. Lefebvre had written in his last book uh, intensively about the rhythms, the rhythm of the urban environment. And I won't go too deeply into that because it will not help you and not help me anyway. But we wrote that these spaces, these nodes along the side of the streets, are shaped by body rhythmic densifications and the continual performance of difference such as are also increasingly and it form, increasing in form of everyday lives. Polyrhythmic means that people with very different rhythm are encountering. In Lefebvre's analogy, it's the body of ourselves has different organs with different rhythms. And despite of these different rhythms, we still are alive. And we as society are people with different opinions, different uh, attitudes, uh, different obsessions different ways of mobility, different rhythms, and nevertheless we work more or less. And he never wanted to speak about mobilization, because he was also dreaming of the pedestrian as the only 
legitimate uh, urban experience. But if we are introducing motorized mobility, then this is even more true for the urban environment, uh, and especially for these highway nodes that we investigated. So for us, these nodes represent excellent sites where both individuals Roots, routines, and rituals, political transitions, and urban transformations can be explored. Uh, if you would, if you send this sentence to a British one, he has no troubles. If you send this to a German one, the German uh, scholar would ask you, "What means root? What means routine? What means ritual?" So luckily, we didn't define what that is, but we had a, we had in brackets a famous uh, sociologist who used that as well. So this had been the introduction let's say the entertaining introduction into what we have done. So what have been the methods we wanted to use when we are driving alongside the roads between Vienna, Tallinn, and the, Bulgarish, um, the Bul turkish bulgarian border? Again, this is a scientific, this, we are still in the scientific application, so we have to give evidence that you are capable of doing that. So we first showed what we did before, before we showed them what we wanted to do. So what did we do before? We did uh, mapping diagrams, and that is something we want to do tomorrow as well. And one of the mapping diagrams we thought is very instructive and striking to show is this one we did in Munich as being invited by a theater festival. The theater festival, as many theater festivals, put some Euro containers into the street in very busy parts of the city of Munich and hoped that people would come by and encounter with the artists that should performatively involve them into whatever artists proposed, and we proposed to make a network diagram of the experience of mobility and migration from people living in Munich, and we had a partner who studied herself a second-hand car export by African boys from Germany to Africa, and what we did was that we asked people to come into the container and then to do a live mapping of what the people tell us. So if, if for example, our friend tells us that somewhere in the city of Munich, uh, these African boys collect all the second-hand cars on a big parking next to the Olympic Stadium. We draw the Olympic Stadium, uh, parking some cars. Then they bring them to the harbor of Antwerp. So we made a line connecting the first drawing with the harbor of Ham Hamburg, uh, Antwerp. We made a little big boat. And then they, because we thought this container is an inverted globe, so then, of course, the boat goes quite a long way around the container and arrives here at Ghana in Africa, and then the cars are going into a convoy to some other country, and then they are resold and brought to their end uses. And it worked very nicely because when we did this first drawing, that was of course casted because we had no, no, we hadn't invited anybody. It was just our partner. Somebody came in and said, oh, I'm working for the theater as, you know, as light engineer, and uh, I, did, I did export cars to Africa already in the 70s. So he wanted to bring in his expertise as well, so we had to have, then we had a second car dealer, which was, of course, a bit non-representational for what Munich people are doing. <laughs> and, but after the while, we had several more, and we had a nice overview of people with very different uh, uh, experience. For example, very, and a very nice, Let's say the story was a young girl, Turkish girl, whose old mother died. And surprisingly to her and her sisters, the mother wanted to get buried back home in Anatolia. And this was a big problem for the family because how do you get her home at reasonable costs? And how to get her home? Because in her last wish, she wrote down that it should be a Muslim uh, funeral. Uh, uh, following all the rules of the religion. That means that within 24 hours she should be sent back home and without, you know, openly buried, just in linen and not enclosed in some uh, non-halal container and, and buried in time, otherwise her soul would never be, you know, rescued by whomever. But interestingly, in Munich, there is a service for that problem. There is a young Turkish guy who makes funeral service back home for Muslim families, and almost every second nurse in hospitals has his business card. So in case these problems pop up, they are solved immediately. The guy made an interesting agreement with the 
religious leader of the of the Muslim uh, community that when when the dead course is stored in a religious place, there's a timeout. So you just have to bring the dead course uh, to some specific place, then there's timeout, then you can check the trip, then he sent back, that, then the time starts counting again, but then it's possible to make that in time. And he's so successful that he has really a lot of, uh, there's a lot of demand, and interestingly later, a young African a uh, woman came in and told her, her her mother was also buried by this Turkish guy. So he's not only offering service to Turkish Muslims, but to Muslims all over the world. So he's a global player in the funeral business in Munich. But they are very exotic figures. Of course, there's the BMW engineer who is traveling to China to build up a new plant. But this, this is a method that we proposed as a key method for our research that is easily done. This. Uh, simple comic style drawings are encouraging all the people to enter conversation because it doesn't look too professional. Also, we have studied architecture, so we can theoretically draw much better. And here you can see what happened at the end. At the end, we had so many drawings that it got so confusing that nobody could identify the roots anymore. So we added MP3 players, these little black things on the wall with headphones, where we had audio tracks running that explained uh, what I've told you just before, so that people could have the headphones and try to follow uh, the roots and the experience of these people. Of course, interestingly, it's a cultural event, so you have all these hipsters uh, when you want to make photographs, as if you make participatory projects in open space. Strangely, all the people from my friends' performances, I know because they're also my friends, or they're, they're students which got some easy points for participating. <coughs> and this is, for example, this, the dense drawing. You see the Mosque of Munich, you see the <coughs> Olympia Tower, you see cars, you see hospitals, you see hotels, blah, blah, blah. And this is another project that we proposed, uh, that we showed them to give evidence of our capacities. Uh, this is really a map, but a flat map. And it doesn't look like a map to you, but when I remind you on the very famous first map of the London Underground, of all underground <coughs> lines, uh, there was the idea to make a, a map or cartography as simple and as abstract as possible, that it still is readable despite the many confusing angles and curves of the underground system. So what you see here is really a map from below showing, for example, the path of a former guest worker family going from southeast to central Europe, then north crossing the Austria and the Alps, and then going to the west to Mannheim. And here you can have we have the super signs so that also idiots see that this is the eastern home Mannheim line. And there is a little pole inside with a loudspeaker, and then again an MP3 player. And if you enter a specific sphere, you can listen to the audio tracks that explain the migration history of a typical Turkish-German family going back and forth every two years only. Nowadays, they have been going back and forth every year once upon a time. Now they go, they fly to Antalya for holidays and bring their relatives to the coast. But every second year, they still have to go to the home because that is part of the family game. And other people you can see here are, for example, Banja is half of the name Banja Luka. Banja Luka was a very contested place in, the, in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And in Austria we had a lot of refugees coming from Banja Luka. And so it was very likely to meet some, but it's very easy to meet somebody from Banja Luka in Austria. In this case, this was a, definitely a war refugee from Yugoslavia in the war that came to Austria working in the tourism industry and ended up as a, as a waitress in the highway gas station restaurant. And those people, who, these circles represent local fitters that just go around and usually love to go to the gas station to have a beer or a drink or even have their club to play darts. And then from Kirovs, that is a lady that is doing to had been doing toilet service and one of the baths had been we ourselves 
being represented in the diagram as well. And the diagram was, which I forgot to tell you, directly on the parking lot of a very large gas station with a restaurant. So we asked the owner of the gas station and the family running the restaurant if we can have the parking lot for one month installation. And we promised them that I'm a historian, so I'm serious, and that it's part of an art festival, so you get a lot of public relations. And so they have been very proud that they are part of the festival and they had to get more guests probably and good PR work. And so they just skipped all the parkings for the guests and offered that to us. In that case, we had no submission at any administration unit. We informed everybody from police to local mayors, but we all told them that we only inform you what we're doing, but we will not apply because we asked the owner. And they were all so happy that they didn't bother with any, you know, thing. The only thing is that the police told us we should make some safety measures. That means that they put up these little things here that cars don't crash into our installation. And a car crashed into our installation, but it didn't change much from uh, the installation and, and with the car. Lokale Monteur. Erwin, 33, wohnt in Windisch-Gersten, 11 Kilometer von der Raststation St. Pankratz. Zwischen 1995 und 1998 ist er täglich mit seinem Privatauto zu einem Arbeitsplatz nach Linz gependelt. So I won't show you the, all the track because it's in German. And we asked friends of us, or radio speakers, to speak the tracks, so the track, so the voices are, are, are known or familiar to the people. And the sound of the beginning is the official traffic alarm of the Austrian public radio. So the designation is also very familiar to everybody because it means, oh God, something happens on the street. And you can see the, here before this, the truck drivers used our installation. These are the artist friends who are hanging around. In the background is a German family going on holidays. And here it's interesting, a grandma with grandchild adapting our installation that was of course not designed to play softball. But we also had, interestingly, Turkish families parking in front of the Istanbul sign and making their break there and even praying towards the direction that we, by accident, uh, built some sort of target for them. But it obviously worked, but we didn't make photographs about that. So we argued that we are very skilled in doing these things and we are social competent and we want to travel now from Vienna to Tallinn and to the Turkish Bulgarian border using these techniques for gaining knowledge from people we meet. And so this is the route. Originally we wanted to go it two times only, but then we didn't get a truck, uh, a car to rent, so we purchased the car. Since we had a car purchased, we had no time limitations, and we traveled a bit too much for scientific, uh, let's say, criteria. So this is our truck, a Ford Transit, very romantic uh, uh, notion from, for, for Western European people, not only for boys but also for girls, because Ford Transit was the car associated with the Turkish migrants. And Transit was of course a nice name for cultural projects. And we also purchased a little trailer and built up this minimalist cage that could be used for other purposes, which we will see later. So we call that embedded research and, as, and uh, assimilation into the field of mobile experts. Then we asked a friend who, whom we exploited before to make us some fancy design, which changed the research radically because we were stopped at each border having this, paint, this design on the car because before we were just considered to be Slavic traders, but now we were going to be considered art people that can be asked for money for nothing because they have no idea how it works. And we were visiting second-hand car markets which played a crucial role in the post-socialist transformation. But we also collected artworks from artists dealing with similar issues, like in this case Mindagos Kavalakas, Kavalakas uh, photo series about second-hand car markets in Lithuania. Uh, we also studied post-human philosophy uh, when we had been to the toilet and coming back from the toilet, we saw our car in interrogation and conversation with another car. 
Of course, we have no evidence if the cars spoke to each other, but you know there have been the, the last documenter extremely uh, uh, emphasizing on, on the agency that plants, things, and animals might have. And so why, why, not should, why, why shouldn't a car have an agency and a friend or meeting? Even it's the same for transit in a different typology, in a rather bad condition. And then we transformed the trailer into a drawing board where we made exercises in mapping, definitely uh, at some notes with the help of our research partners because we needed language competence, of course. But we also had been to some academic conferences because you know, we have had to assimilate into the field of mobility studies as well. And so we also offered uh, mapping seminars at these academic conferences, which had been total failures at the beginning because nobody really knew what this is about because everybody just wants to present his book or his lecture, his paper as a fetish. But when Michel started to mention some famous people that are part of this diagram, everybody wanted to become part of the diagram as well. So recently we got an, we got an, an invitation to make the, the, the cover of one of these mobility studies books with a diagram where each author is part of the diagram. And then we started to focus on specific issues like the Tallinn, the harbour town in Estonia, which has this very little old town you see to the right hand side, which is extremely pretty, beautiful, and one of the most beautiful German towns, which is not very politically correct, but it's a foundation by the Hanset. And it is really, it, since it was not destroyed in none of the wars, it looks much more, much more pretty than any German city you could imagine. So it's really the most beautiful German city, but outside of Germany. And then you have some sort of, uh, let's say, 19th century expansion and a very large, of course, new town, socialist housing block new town with 200,000, uh, 150 to 200,000 Russian, mainly ethnic Russian inhabitants that were imported during the Russian uh, Soviet period. And the harbor that you see to the front is enormously large. It had been a mixed use harbor before. But Estonia as being the number one country in European modernization, European Union modernization, had built five, four new harbors. One harbor for oil, one harbor for cars, one harbor for containers, uh, one harbor for normal cargo. And this harbor is now devoted only for ferry boats and cruise ships. And it has eight million ferry boat guests coming from Helsinki each year, every three hours, and they have an enormous impact on the rhythm of the city because whenever the boat arrives, several hundred pe until 2,500 people, or several thousand people are running around the city, especially if cruise ships arrive. And of course, all the economy of the city is more or less oriented towards the arriving passengers. From the big warehouses to the alcohol shops and uh, the beggars and taxi drivers. So everything pops up alongside the roads of these tourists. And interestingly, nobody of our friends in Tallinn ever wanted to deal with this issue because this is the sort of dirty issue, which is not exactly what you want to deal with if you're an artist or urban activist. Our friends are doing urban gardening projects, for example, in Tallinn, but are not dealing with this strange uh, development. And thanks to the Tallinn Architecture Biennale, we invited ourselves to the Biennale, arguing that we are invited by the harbor to do something. And we invited ourselves to the harbor, telling them that you are invited by the Tallinn Biennale. So both have been happy that they have a collaboration. And Tallinn Harbor offered us the parking lot to the main exit, actually, from the line that brings all the guests from Helsinki, and we used our trailer in this case as sort of base for a small scale network installation, same style I had shown you before, but this time much smaller. And the routes that we investigated have been all based on interviews with passengers of the ferry line. So one passenger is a Russian investor that co finances all the pretty buildings in Tallinn that the Tallinn population praises as being uniquely post Soviet and anti Russian chic, uh, but sadly financed by Scandinavian investment funds where the Russians put the money in, get it invested in the safe heavens. And others are, in that case, a Russian 
barmaid that had been a school teacher but kicked out of business, of school as a job and now works as a waitress. And for example, uh, of course, boys, uh, men from Helsinki that go to Tallinn just for drinking as much as possible and making a virtual revenue because of different prices. And other people are uh, uh, migrant workers from Estonia that go to work in Helsinki area because the wages are double to two, three times as high as back home. And interestingly, this, this, this doesn't look like a, like a low class you know, terminal. It looks like, a, like an airport where people go one side for, for low paid jobs and the others go the other side for getting as much consumer goods as, as possible. Especially alcohol, people are radically drunk in this area which of course was for us very exotic and for the, our Tallinn friends very much a shame. Mm -hmm. And the other project deals with this Bulgarian truck company, the monopolist in communist times, having 5,000 trucks running, all of them Mercedes-Benz, you could imagine a communist country, having a truck company that is larger than the western truck companies, having better cars, more modern cars, the most expensive cars in the world for driving goods, in this network, and this map is from their own representation that you can see, of course, all the transport that comes from west to east has to bypass Bulgaria, so either you can transport your things yourself with your Austrian or German truck company, then you will have a lot of trouble passing through Bulgaria, at least paper trouble. But if you hire the Bulgarian truck company, it is first of all much cheaper, second, no trouble. Bulgarian truck drivers in communist times had been very badly paid, but they could compensate by smuggling, and they had the guarantee that it would be never ever checked when they enter their home borders, because the body secretary had, in the village had ordered everybody of importance who could control you had ordered jeans, jackets, diesel, anything. You know? <laughs> so truck drivers at the period of time had been part of the richest class in Bulgaria, with the highest reputation because having so many consumer goods. And after the fall of communism, we know that Bulgaria became definitely again the low wage country where many German and Western uh, transport companies registered the companies in Bulgaria or the drivers and the cars in Bulgaria to save money. But now the drivers are GPS controlled. There are not so many borders anymore where you can unchecked and therefore smuggling makes the revenue. So they cannot make any additional income. And now they're really the poorest of the poor in the chain. And, but what you can see here is that we, what we see about the West is more or less obvious. But we, what we see about these areas is of enormous importance. We see that, there is, that they have been exporting, importing to and from Libya. They have been exporting, importing to and from this is, Aleppo, this is Syria and Aleppo, uh, it's Iran, Iraq, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, they had been the major holding transport company for all new investments in the decolonized areas. So when Austrian state-owned industries were selling weapons or steel factories or water plants or hospitals, which they did, to Iran, Iraq and Libya, it had been the Bulgarians to be our partners. And in Bulgaria, this company is of extremely high reputation because it shows how important Bulgaria was as a global player in the communist period of time. And unluckily, the company was then sold to a German company and declined radically in size and in importance. And we visited several of their former uh, service stations in Bulgaria, which consisted of garage, gas station, wage, uh, customs office, strangely, a hotel for truck drivers, very obscure, a restaurant and a nightclub. So this was close to the Turkish border, and so they thought they should make sort of additional income as a truck company by offering service to truck drivers from all over the world, and later also to some people that want to stop for other reasons. When you wanted to Past Bulgaria, communist period of time, you had to change a lot of money at the border, a little piece of money for Bulgarians, but a lot for Westerns, because you couldn't, you couldn't uh, 
buy so many things by just driving through the country. So these strange uh, fun palaces that appeared along the street had been mainly to get Western currency into the country because we all wanted to get rid of it. And again, it was a sort of very absurd combination of serious truck service, uh, nightclub atmosphere and prostitution, and markets, of course, for goods of all kinds, uh, controlled by the state-owned import-export company. This is today, it's a very <coughs> sad, aesthetically beautiful ruin. This is another of these companies where our <coughs> research partner is talking to some old guard who is still protecting what is no more working. And this is our own logistic hub in the city of Vienna, where we rented a place. Panalpina, as you see, is a very beautiful name. It, is, it was a big Swiss company. And you see the logo to the right, it's a person like an angel with wings flying, but the, having the feet on the planet Earth and having a sort of sail in front of him. And so that means that this is what they offer, sailing, road, earth, and air transport. Uh, disappeared, but it's still there. And we have this place over there for collecting and testing the goods we brought from our trips. As you can see here, we, we plundered the archive of the Somat Truck Company, which there's still an office and there's still a nice lady that take, took care of all the old archive. And since we had a very good friend, Nikola Mikov, who could convince her with his charm uh, to, to allow us to scan things, she thought it's too complicated if we come, if we come with a camera and a scanner to the office, it's better we just take all the material with us and scan it at home. She never ever asked to get it back, so she seems to be happy that we are taking care of it. And of course it was very nice having all this material uh, that of course has, a, has agency, it speaks to you in the sense of Bruno Latour's actor network theory. It's very clear you can't, you can't watch a photograph from the 70s, 80s with specific hair to rocker style communist truck driver that is not speaking to you and bringing up other stories of your own parents doing hitchhiking at the period of time, etc., etc. And then we also made serious conferences in our project space in this logistic hub. Uh, introducing a project about forced migration, which immediately brought the public radio and TV to us because everybody was very interested in the forced migration, which was very interesting in that case. These friends of us made a project about uh, mapping forced migration in Austria before the heavy stream of forced migration in a seminar with students at the TU Vienna. But when they finished the seminar in summer semester of 2015, uh, the big wave started. So after having finished the seminar, they were invited everywhere with their project, but their project was not about the, the big wave, but again about, about normality of migration and forced migration and the management of migration in Austria. But anyway, it was for, for the good for them as well as for us. Then we can see that we made a very funny big table with all the books we had read or we pretended to have read or we should have read. And you can, as you can see, this is a bit, a bit of an Weber and and they're very much impressed about the many books that we could purchase with our uh, budget. And we have to confess that we have an idea what all the books are about, but we had no chance to read them all. And some of the books definitely do not make any sense to us. But we also had the chance to purchase beautiful books about mapping, about uh, graphic novels. And some of the theoretical books also made a lot of sense to us and shifted our perception, of course, as well that are friends studying our library. And that is one of our trophies we brought from Tallinn Harbor. So we watched Finnish Finn man. What are they purchasing when they get back home to Finland? And so this is the average choice of a Finnish man. You can, it's very interesting to us. When they purchase these things, they're already heavily drunk. So they still have the competence to purchase these things and pack them. But we figured out that when they arrive in Tallinn at the harbor, they can already pre-order these packages. Then they go to the city, get totally drunk, and when they get back home to the harbor, they get the trolley with the drinks already. And this represents a value of 
160 euro, which we paid for the science fund of the city of Vienna. It's the city of Vienna, so they are very open to spending money on you know, all, all things that help you to increase your social competence <laughs> somehow. <laughs> somehow. Uh, but we could also argue that if you would have purchased the same thing in Finland, it would have costed 320. So we made a virtual save, you know, or revenue of, yeah, of, of, of the same, 180, and the boat trip costs only 50, uh, 40 euro for one person, but most of them go in, in teams with a group ticket, so it's only 20. So they all argue that this, this pays off, the trip pays off totally. And it's not a class issue, it's also not necessarily uh, a gender issue, because also women love to purchase alcohol, of course, they have to have one hand free for the other things they purchased. So, and, and we've met a, a young anthropologist who is now the director of the Finnish Institute in Berlin. And she told us she, she was doing that with her parents as well. So it was Papa Finn, Mama Finn, uh, daughter, son, and all they, had, they all had the trolleys. The, the parents had the big trolley, the children had the small trolley. And it is a sort of kind of a less transgression that Finn families need to do, like, like their sauna experience, which is also very strange to us, that they need to do once a year, at least. <laughs> and then we also made exhibitions, like artistically or design exhibitions, about mapping, our, about a research mapping. This was in Sofia. At the left-hand side, you see something we also brought with us from the trip. This is the traffic shield at the harbor of Tallinn, how you would have, have to line up with your cars. Originally, we wanted to steal the sign, but then we thought it's very absurd if we have a Vienna number plate, you know, dismantling a sign. We, we would have a local number plate. Uh, nobody would care, you know, if you are looking in blue collar uh, dress. But then we just climbed up the sign and made a photograph of the producer at the backside and asked the producer, and interestingly, you could purchase it for a quite low price, same price as the alcohol, 160 euro, for such a beautiful sign ready-made art, and it is of enormous emotional value for us, again, not for the Finns. For the Finns, a sign to the harbour means nothing because they, they grew up with the harbour, but for Austrians which don't have a seaside, or they lost the seaside after the end of monarchy, uh, every seaside is, is totally loaded up. And on the other hand side, this graphic design that you see on the, sh on the sign, is influenced by the Austrian social democrat, philosopher and social economist Otto Neurath and his partner, graphic designer Gerd Arns. So if there was any contribution from Austrians to political economy, then it had been Otto Neurath's uh, visual language, universal visual language. So for us, this gives evidence that we are the good democrats, social democrats in the world, and that unluckily, the only, one of the effects is that graph, let's say, Traffic, tra traffic signs and visual graphics are inspired by Otto Neurath, but not so much the improvement of the world in his you know, social democrat ideas. Otto Neurath had to leave Austria because being of Jewish descent and because being social democrat, he joined the modernist architects movement, Siam, but the Siam architects didn't like him very much because he was so obsessively social democratic and not opportunistic in any way, like Le Corbusier, you know, who would, would have wanted to collaborate with each government, no matter where and of which political side. Uh, but for us, this is really of importance, and of course, it's speaking to us. And it's speaking, of course, much more to us when we show it in Vienna, because all our Viennese, Viennese friends from the field of art and architecture admire this sign, you know, this sign that seems to be totally senseless for Finnish friends, is of enormous importance for us. At, at the floor, you see sort of indoor variation of our, of our route diagram of passengers. Then here's a little first attempt of the Vienna case study. Uh, a little case study of the uh, biggest Asian market in Varsha, done by two ex-students of mine that we passed by there by accident. First, we, pa we, did, we, passed, we, did, we just passed by, didn't know that it exists. Then in Tallinn, we learned that all the Russians in Tallinn don't buy their goods in Russia, but at the Chinese market. So in spite of the Russian communist souvenirs, all the rest is, comes from China by container. So we wanted to see where it comes from and just drove there. And again, we purchased this little scooter that is used by the vendors because the market is so large. 
that they need a, a special vehicle to drive indoor from place A to B. And we also made exhibitions at the nodes. In Bulgaria, in this case, we went to the former headquarters of Somat Truck Drivers Company in the east of Sofia. There's still a canteen still working. Most of the people uh, who go there had worked for Somat before, or the children of people who worked for Somat, they're all working for other companies. Most of them are working for other companies. But when we came there and we built up the exhibition with a nice collection of smuggled goods of the good old times, like, you know, rock music, uh, strange thing like Nesquik, uh, pornographic magazines, etc. Uh, the the owner of the of the canteen came over to us with a big bottle of schnapps, of course, and started to talk with us. So we were totally overwhelmed by people who wanted to inform us, but we couldn't understand anything. And we also found a little maquette of one of the service stations of Somat. So exactly this service station I showed you before, the right hand service station was protected by a guard. The guard had two little dogs. It was very easy to talk with him. He spoke brilliant English. He was with an academic degree, but having no job and being the guard of a backhand service station because he's the, he was the son of the former manager. And he showed us around, opened all the doors, and inside in the lobby of the hotel for drug drivers, we found a beautiful table with a plexiglass vitrine with the model of the compound. This bus station again was removed by the gentrification of Süd and Westbahnhof into Hauptbahnhof, but still having a little bus station aside. And then a private company, Lagus, who was organizing all these bus lines with partners in Bulgaria, Romania, Hungary, uh, Slovakia, and former Yugoslavia, or successor states of former Yugoslavia, had the idea that they are looking for a place that is so unattractive that nobody could gentrify it. And so they They asked, they, they, they made a new station, which some of you might know, beneath the highway bridge. So be, beneath the highway bridge, nobody can build anything. And the highway is so important that it will be never removed. So they can stay there as long as they want, as, as long as they agree with the owner of the highway who can use the land. The owner of the highway is the Republic of Austria, or a 100% daughter of the Republic of Austria. That obviously seems to be not so much a friend of the city of Vienna's administra administration. But they are, of course, they are also not allowed to build any building beneath. So the terminal building is at the side, and there's only this one mobile sausage box that moves be, uh, below this ramp. But now the city of Vienna, since we have Flixbus now, uh, more and more people of the administration of the city of Vienna, and especially at the song contest several years before, figured out, oh god, what a horrible place. We have to build a new fancy bus station. And even the Green Party politicians have figured out if there's so many people, we can make a, a self-financing bus station. If all these people will consume in a shopping mall and in cafeterias, then we can ask so much rent for the places that we don't need Blagos anymore to manage the, the place. But luckily for us, or unluckily for the city of Vienna, each real estate broker and speculant, of course, knows where our places, where a highway cross and the public uh, U-Bahn line comes close to each other. There are not many, and these are unavailable for the city of Vienna since they announced the plans, of course. And the interesting thing is that we wanted to investigate the traffic, of, uh, the passengers and the bus drivers' experience in between Vienna Sof and Sofia, or Vienna and Tallinn, but between Vienna and Tallinn there's not much traffic. Only one line, two times a week. Very often, transporting African men visiting their Baltic girlfriends, whom they met in Italy, where they worked before. And, but when we wanted to intensify our investigation about bus traffic, the ref, this wave of uh, forced, forced migration happened in autumn 2015. So everybody was congratulating us. Oh, what a hot issue. What an important issue. We, we congratulate you for this, for your research. It's totally matching with the problems of today. And we said, this is actually not what we wanted to do. We do not want to, to research about exceptionality, but about the everyday. But of course, we could not escape ourselves as well. You know, the people would kill you if you 
we pay you, you know, you, you pay you a salary that you research on mobility and and you ignore the the wave. But then we had a good argument and we said, ah interesting. When we went to the border, we figured out that there was uh, the Vienna border in the crisis, in the period of crisis, was a was not a place of demobilization as you usually would criticize in migration studies. So people were were, were only stopped for being treated, uh, for being controlled for medical reasons, but not for passport reasons and citizenship. So nobody of our armed forces dared to control anybody because they were so afraid to have to produce the same images as the Hungarians produced. So it was instead a place of remobilization. So people came from Hungary, were somehow organized, managed, and put first into trains. Then they figured out that this doesn't work to bring them all in the train to Vienna, because then they entered the train station, and this is a problem of management. So soon they learned that the buses are the best devices for bringing in the migrants at night to the city of Vienna, to the emergency shelters, so no racist Viennese figure would see anybody. Mm -hmm. And originally they expected the, 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 the refugees to stay for some days and to bring them further to the German border, but most of them escaped after the first night and r run to the station, to the train, because that is what they learned from their mobile phones, what you have to do. So they accelerated uh, transport to bring bringing them partly directly from the border to the, to the German border. But then the Germans closed their border to Austria. So in Upper Austria, they had to start up a lot of uh, emergency refugee accommodation units. But the interesting thing is that they used brand new buses from the most known Austrian bus companies for transporting uh, the refugees from the border to the other border. And so we thought, this is interesting, so we will retrace you know, this sort of reorientation of, of bus functions, that buses normally transport tourists and the classic uh, Austrian Balkan uh, sort of old Austrian-Hungarian, <laughs> Yugoslav, Bulgarian, Romanian families to each other, and the daily commuters to uh, Bratislava, but they have less modern buses than those buses that go the other lines, and uh, see what happens if a, if a bus driver with migrant background has to drive the now real migrants. So there is a sort of that started to be a hierarchy of urgency of migration. Interestingly for us in Austria is of course then that when there had been the Hungarian crisis long ago and when there had been the Yugoslav wars, we had no problems and no political discussions about the integration of people. Somehow they got integrated almost automatically, but, but of course this is not really true. This is the mystification of the Austrian bourgeois class as being the good guys. So nowadays, we don't want to be reminded of any problems. But we see the problems, of course, of, about the current management of migration. So what we did was doing a, a bus tour with two, several nodes of transport and mobility from Vienna to the Austrian-Hungarian border. And at the, host, at the Hungarian border, we invited the mayor of the border village of Nikolsdorf to guide us around to the places of the hotspot of autumn 2015, but we did the tour in December when there was no migrant in there anymore. So it was not it was not a sort of social voyeurism tour. It was a tour to a place where nobody was there anymore. But you could see the you could see the traces of of tents, uh, of uh, emergency shelters, etc. And after we did the tour, we made this drawing ourselves, a sort of mix of cartography and comic style drawing, a sort of. Uh, organized mental map, without totally out of scale, of course, and we we met the mayor of the city again, and then the, 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 the mayor of the city made these handwritten comments. So immediately found out what is wrong on our drawing. So you can see whatever you if you would if you would have made a perfect drawing, we wouldn't have had any effect. But since of course we made a lot of mistakes. He felt obliged that he has to add all these things that we had forgotten onto our map. And so only one example. This 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 arrow means 
Novarok Halle. So here is Novarok Halle. For, for, for people who might know, Novarok is a very famous rock festival organized at the border. <laughs> so we have noise here, the wind goes there, so the Hungarians, the Hungarians just have to suffer from noise. And the Novarok festival happened at the end of, at the beginning of school holidays, end of school time, so June, July. And when, the, when this wave of refugees entered the border, the roadies had been still there, you know, doing some repair. They have a sort of warehouse here, and a big open meadow that they use for the rock concerts. They have some mobile toilets at the station, and they were repairing. And when, when the mayor or the people were seeking for help, the roadies were just passing by with the bus, you know, and seeing what's good. You need, you need help. And they opened their warehouse, as the first shelter for refugees. They just moved 50 mobile toilets to the meadow, and two days later, uh, the Red Cross built up the tents, and it was, and they said that there was no need for organization, in fact, they're professionals. And they asked other professionals, and it worked. And strangely, the tent was only used for quite a short time, because then the uh, first, the now Prime Minister of Austria, then the director of Austrian Railway State uh, Company, said, accelerate them. And the police and the military forces said, we'll accelerate them. And then, and then we started with this bus transport. And later we uh, transferred these things into an animation. There's a nice work about Otto Neurath, a social democratic philosopher, that he was uh, fleeing from Vienna to Netherlands before, then to London, and in London he met a filmmaker, and they were studying how to make uh, a sort of diagrammatic visual language for explaining, for explaining economy to normal people. Wie der Mittag ist heute. Einkaufen in Neuss, wo auch dieselben Sachen hier wie drüben gleich verkostet. 